So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our next webinar in our Learn at Home educational webinar series, which is brought to you by the University of Rhode Island, specifically the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, and the very special unit within that called Cooperative Extension. Next slide. So just a quick word on Cooperative Extension for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, I'm very proud. My name is Kate Venturini, by the way. I'm an Extension educator at the University of Rhode Island um, in Cooperative Extension, and we bring science-based university resources to the public. Um, we've done that since 1914. Obviously, I've not been around that long, but um, we focus on bringing science out to people in communities to help them solve problems. Um, mainly related to the environment around land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy, and healthy lifestyles. And um, the class that Melissa is bringing to us tonight called Outdoor Classrooms, I think will probably hit on most of these areas, which is very exciting for us. Next slide. So we, um, especially now, feel it's very important to mention that um, we do have some guiding principles and extension that we operate with. Um, and one of them is that we are really dedicated to Rhode Island's people and the communities that um, folks live in. And um, as I said before, we're really committed to improving folks quality of life and livelihoods and the health of our environment through access to science. Um, and we also believe in social justice, and this is especially important now. Um, and it's just important for folks to know that um, one of the silver linings of this webinar series has been that it's allowed us to um, provide access to information to people over the internet, which if you have internet, that's, that's a barrier down right there. So um, we're really striving to deepen our cultural understanding and proficiency, and we hope that um, you all will help us spread our reach even wider by sharing not only the, this webinar, but others in our series and other resources on our webpage, which I'll talk about a little later. We want to make sure we're being inclusive and, and addressing um, diverse stakeholder needs. And so thank you to all of you for participating. Next slide. So just before we um, get going, I wanted to mention that for all of you who are here tonight, you will get um, an email in your inbox after the um, webinar that has a link to a survey in it. And we really love and appreciate you for completing the survey because it's actually one of the ways that we measure whether or not our um, the educational information we deliver is having an impact on folks. So thank you for taking just a minute or two to complete that survey when you're done. And then the, this is the question we get the most. How do I view this webinar um, if I only caught half of it or can I share it with my friends? And the answer is yes. Within the week, it'll be uploaded to our Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. You can just Google that or type in URI Cooperative Extension in YouTube to access a recording of the webinar um, and all of the others that we've offered through this series. And all of those webinars will also be closed captioned thanks to a team of folks who are doing that for us. So that is enough from me. We've got just about 50, over 50 people here to hear from Melissa Gillette, who I've known for almost 10 years, I guess. Um, we first met at the Roger Williams Park Community Garden in Providence. Um, and Melissa, I could say many things, but she has been um, a tremendous Master Gardener volunteer um, and a real advocate for youth engagement in the outdoors. And you're all in for a real treat. Um, she can tell you a little bit more about her 15 minute field trips, but um, please join me in welcoming Melissa Gillette. Hi everyone. So I'm with 15 minute field trips. We became a nonprofit in July and our whole idea is to help youth advocate for the environment through the arts and community action. So I'm just going to roll right along. So if you miss anything, there will be a recording. I want to make sure there's time for questions at the end. So as you're. Um, learning in the outside, you figure out like what do you want to attract? So if you want to learn about birds, how will you attract birds? If you want to learn about insects, how are you going to attract those? So it basically comes down to habitats. 
habitats must provide food, water, shelter, and breeding space. So depending on what you want to attract, that might include host plants, uh, tree cover, access to water, the foods that the animals like to eat. So if we think about bees, bees are very important to our ecology and our economy in that they pollinate one out of every three bites of our food. And a lot of people think of honeybees first, and honeybees are actually an introduced species from Europe, but we have over 4,000 native bees in North America. In this area, New England, we have about 300, and they have different types of habitats. So some of them actually live in hollow wood or clumps of grass. So if you're growing any kinds of cane fruits like blackberries or raspberries, when you're done with them, you wanna cut them so that you have about 12 inches left because some of them might be hibernating in those hollow tubes over the winter. Uh, some live in snags or dead trees. They might live under logs. Some of them even live in, live in leaf litter. So you wanna leave leaf litter for those. And different bees like different kinds of food. Some of them prefer like tube flowers. Some prefer flat flowers because there's a lot of diversity in in bees. There's over 4,000 species. They have different length tongues. Like we think of honeybees as being so important, but it's actually bumblebees that pollinate certain plants because they've co-evolved with them. So bumblebees are great for our native plants like our squashes and our blueberries. They have the, the right length of tongue. There's other plants that are only pollinated by one kind of bee, like vanilla is only pollinated by the molybdenum bee. But since most vanilla is not grown in its native Mexico and it's grown in places like Indonesia and Madagascar, those are actually hand pollinated by people with a little stick. But there's many ways that you can support bee diversity and learn about bees in your community. Um, even invasive plants like Phragmites, which are reeds, are great hollow stems you can use to make a bee house. And sometimes it's just being lazy is actually good for the environment. Like, Leave dead trees as long as there's no danger of it falling on your house. Leave rotting logs, leave leaf litter, and you'll actually help promote biodiversity in your area. This is just a few examples of bee houses. So uh, these two, oh, it's not letting me let the click. All right, in presentation mode, I can't use the clicker, but the ones on the left and the right are from Garden in the Woods, which is in Framingham, Massachusetts. The one in the center was made by volunteers at the Audubon Society in Bristol, Rhode Island. And you see there's a lot of different holes because there's different size bees because we have variety. So you can try different size drill bits like 3 eighths or, or half inch to drill into wood. Uh, these do need to be cleaned regularly because they can get mites. And one of the causes of colony collapse disorder is the varroa mite, which carries a virus. Also with the, the um, honeybees, they're often um, shipped out to lots of locations where they're getting exposed to more diseases. They're getting exposed to pesticides. They are um, getting monocultures. They're only getting one kind of food and they're tired. So that's what's affecting their health. Uh, certain farmers are getting a little bit better about that. They're planting things like mustards and, and wildflowers around the bases of almond trees now. So they get a little more variety in their diet. But something you can do right at home and do as a, as a class is just create different kinds of bug houses, not just for bees, but for other insects too. Like um, straw is great for lace wings and those are your natural predator insects. You can use pine cones for ladybugs. There's a video, if you go to YouTube and you type in 15 minute field trips, you'll find my build a better bug house video and that will go through all the steps on what materials you need and how to make it. When you have a habitat, you wanna plant in layers. Natural habitat is not a big lawn with a tree in the middle. You need to have layers and that's going to address different types of, of animals that work together. Nature is a closed system. So it's not just, okay, I have my tree and I have my grass and everything's gonna to work together. Everything occupies a different hierarchy and a different uh, job level within the ecosystem. So if you have different layers, and different size trees, you're gonna create more habitat and the animals are gonna feel safer. So I have this bird feeder that I put up on my deck and I had this big lilac bush and I'd get birds once in a while, but they had to fly about eight feet to get to the bird feeder from the lilac bush. So then one day I put in a pear tree, a little baby one. And after like three or four years, the pear tree is now huge and touching the bird feeder. And now I've 
have almost 30 species of bee birds that come every year. Birds are going to feel safest when they can access food in a sheltered area. So I'm giving them that shelter. So if you're a bird watcher, you want to learn more about birds, setting up a bird feeder in a, in a secluded area where they can access it from a tree or a shrub is going to help them feel safer. Also having native plants. There's a lot of um, trees that provide fruit for birds, for birds that eat fruit. If you go to um, National Wildlife Federation or nwf.org, you can actually type in your zip code and they have two different search engines. They have one where you can just look up native plants and then one that you can look up um, butterflies you want to find and which plants to plant for those. And URI also has a web search, which is right here, webURI.edu, and then backslash Rhode Island Native Plants, and that'll go to the plants that are local in this area. This one's more international. But you want to have a variety, like you don't want to have just one type of tree or one type of flower, because different insects and different animals like different um, types of plants, like they might like a flat top, like butterflies usually like plants that have a flat top because they taste with their feet and they like something that they can land on and, and check it out. And then hummingbirds like things that are more tube flowers like bee balm or honeysuckle. You can learn just about trees themselves. Trees can be taught to, um, can be used to teach about climate change. This is a tree drawn by a first grader and the directions were to include the five parts of a tree with different types of line. So they created a trunk, different kinds of bark, the branches, the leaves, and the roots. And each of those parts are really great for mitigating climate change. We have the trunk, which is where all the carbon is stored. So trees can sequester carbon. And then the leaves through um, photosynthesis, they convert carbon dioxide and, and sunlight into sugar, and then they give off oxygen. So then they're creating air for us. The leaves and canopy also cool down the air. So you're reducing the need for air conditioning. You're cleaning the air. You're making it easier to breathe, reducing asthma. The roots absorb water and prevent erosion, and they're going to help with flooding because in Rhode Island, we have a lot of um, anxiety about rising sea levels in our area. And because of climate change, our springs are getting uh, wetter and colder. And on the other side, on the, the western part of the U.S., they're getting drier and hotter. So trees kind of help balance that a little bit more. They hold the moisture in and they keep things a lot more balanced. So, And you could even look at just one kind of tree, like oak trees. There are 600 species of oaks and they support all kinds of, of life, anywhere from birds and squirrels down to many insects. There's even oaks that support literally hundreds of kinds of moths. Uh, this oak uh, infographic is actually available on my teacher pay teacher site, also under 50 minute field trips, but just go out and adopt a tree. Learn everything about that tree. Look at the tree in different seasons. Now we talked about uh, food for the, and habitat. The animals also need water. Uh, if you're interested in birds, sometimes people have a heated bird feeder so that they can use it year round. You do want to keep it clean so they're not passing diseases with each other. When you have a bird feeder, you want it to be at least four feet off the ground because the cat will get to it. Amphibians need moisture, obviously. Now, frogs tend to be closer to open bodies of water like ponds and toads are more terrestrial. So they just need a, a moist spot, but again, they're going to be using the leaf litter. Wood frogs actually uh, will hibernate in leaf litter, and they're the only frog you can find in Alaska. And American toads are found almost all over the U.S., and they also hang out in leaf litter. Also, this salamander guy. So leave places for them to hibernate. Another thing you can do to attract um, toads to your yard is have a little toad home, which could be a broken pot with at least a two inch opening, or you can bury a pot on its side, have a little shallow dish with some rocks and some water so they can cool off and get a drink. And here's another example of leaving the leaves. So all kinds of animals live in that leaf litter. Maybe you don't have 
um, leaves fall where you are, but in New England and a lot of um, Canada, you will have um, leaves fall in the fall in, in the autumn. And here's that um, wood frog I told you about. That's a female. Sometimes bumblebees are in there, salamanders, toads, the woolly bear. And one of our own scientists, URI scientist Nancy Caraca, is actually doing a study trying to find uh, do counts on salamanders. And in Rhode Island, we have a very common salamander called the redback salamander. And she is doing research on another salamander that has a similar habitat. It's the Gemma's Mountain salamander in New Mexico. But you don't want to be looking under every log because you're going to disturb habitat. So she came up with creating a wooden box and she fills it with wet wood chips and then drill a hole underneath. And it worked really great with the redback salamander. So now they're trying these artificial logs out in New Mexico because this uh, species they're tracking, the Gemma's Mountain salamander, used to have 600 and now they're down to single dig digits in the last 50 years. So by imitating habitat, we can get more accurate counts. You can do a lot with leaves. You can look at the shapes of them, the color, the texture. Uh, these are kindergartners. They just are looking at the leaves with their magnifying lenses. We put leaves under paper and rub them with crayon. They drew out, they, the first graders cut out leaf shapes and made leaf jewelry. You can have a scavenger hunt. Teach them about the shape first because leaves can be all different colors. Garden plants, uh, if you go to my website, you can actually download this uh, plant part bingo game for free. It's six different bingo cards and then you get a, a six sided die you can print out in cardstock and fold up in tape and it just has the different parts of the plant. So you roll it and you get a root and like, okay, what's on my bingo card? What's what roots do I eat? Oh, carrot, beet, you might roll stem, oh, celery, seed, okay, peas are seeds. So it goes through the different plant parts and that's on um, 50 minute field trips.blogspot.com. You can get that. You can talk about the life cycle of a plant. It starts as a seed and then it grows and then it flowers and then it fruits. And then what happens after that? Do we eat it? What parts do we eat? You can have harvest rituals if you're having a garden at your school or community center. Can you make faces out of it with real food or maybe with, with paper? Teach about healthy eating. Uh, seed hunts are great in the fall because the plants are usually more mature by then. Think about how the seeds move. Seeds can't just get up and walk, but they move in a lot of different ways. They could be carried by the wind, carried by animals, bird droppings. Squirrels are responsible for a lot of our oak trees. And because of climate change, the oak trees are actually migrating further and further north. And so are the animals involved with them. So we have gray squirrels in New England, but the fox squirrels, which enjoy oak and hickory, um, might start moving up north and we might end up with gray and fox squirrel hybrids because they're, they're moving further north and so are the trees. But they are gonna be planting those hickories and those oaks on their way up. Sometimes seeds get stuck on fur or pant legs. And then we have seeds that where the pods burst open or just gravity. So even though this is more of a fall activity, you're gonna be setting that activity up now. You'll be growing things like dill, lettuce, sunflowers and peas, and then enjoying them in the fall. Dandelions, you see more of those in the summer, but you might get a second crop in the fall. Allium is more of a spring flower as well, but milkweed, milkweed is, is just flowering now and then Come September, even August, you're going to get all those seed pods. And this, the milkweed seed pod, it's a pod, it bursts open, and then it's the wind carries it, and it might even be carried by animals because it gets stuck on them. You can do math with this lesson. You can estimate how many seeds are on a sunflower. I had first graders count by tens with this ginormous sunflower up, that you see up top, and we got hundreds of sunflower seeds out of it. So this is just an example of the seed diversity and mo mobility study. So I just got a bunch of red buckets at Dollar Tree, and then we stuck pictures on of what they um, 
how they move and the kids just went out in the garden. They just found seeds and like, okay, this seed got carried by a squirrel. This seed flew in the wind and they just sorted them into the buckets and we talked about it. Another activity is kids um, collect seeds from their lunch. I mean, no, we're concerned about germs right now with COVID-19, but maybe this is something they could do as an at-home activity like, okay, today I ate a peach or I had watermelons and then I glued my seeds onto a card and then they could hold it up for their for their buddies on the virtual classroom, like, what did I have for lunch? Who can tell me what the seed came from? Now, this would be a good opportunity to take a screenshot. So if you do command shift four, you can take a screenshot of this page and then cut those out and stick them on buckets. So these are the six main ways that seeds get around, either wind, gravity, bursting, animals, humans, which includes planting and floating. And you'll find a lot of seeds occupy more than one category. Here's just a little um, exercise sheet I made. So it shows the mobility. And then they can draw it. They can try to identify it. Okay, this is some kind of runner bean. This is a um, devil's trumpet. This is a dandelion. This is a cattail. And then it's not about them like knowing all the answers, but just kind of exploring like, wow, there's so much diversity. Like plants and animals really have figured things out. Maybe we can learn from them. You can also support biodiversity by just looking at how many different types of seeds there are. Even little kids can understand that seeds come in different shapes and colors and so do people. So they can understand a lot of uh, social impact with that as well. We did um, our own little seed packets. The kids did scientific drawings of their seeds. We put them on envelopes. They got to keep their seeds and take them home. Some of them planted them. They just get so fascinated. Even if you just look at beans, there's so many different types of beans. You can tie it into history. And we think of Emily Dickinson as this great poet, which she was, but during her lifetime, she was actually known much more as a botanist. She was very much into her garden and she started uh, her own herbarium when she was only 14. So these are some of her press flower pages along with the Latin name. You could go through Emily Dickinson's poetry and do a scavenger hunt for what kind of flowers or other plants you find in there. Do you have those in your garden? You can even do a field trip to her house where you can actually visit her garden and they've been restoring it over the last few years. They're even using um, sonograms to try to figure out where the edges of certain features were and trying to dig up those um, different heritage plants that she was growing. Another great artist that I love is Maria Sibylla Marion. So she was way ahead of her time. She noticed that certain caterpillars were only found on certain plants. And so she was actually one of the first people to discover that moths and butterflies have a host plant and she would do these beautiful watercolor studies of the insect in all its different life cycles. And she would raise these caterpillars into moths and butterflies and just study them. And she, she, her family owned a printing press, so she ran the printing press and she created her own um, field guides and books about moths and butterflies. And she even went to um, French Suriname, I mean, sorry, Dutch Suriname to study the flora and fauna there. She did get malaria but she um, did survive. She was able to, to take the ship back and then publish her, her magnum opus, Insectorium Surinamensium. But this is a great artist, female artist scientist. This is like the Leonardo da Vinci of, of butterflies and, and moths. So if you want to attract pollinators, you need their food. So we always have flowers in the summer, but what about flowers in the early spring or the late autumn? That's where um, using the plant finder guide with the URI link or the National Wildlife Federation link will help you because then you'll know which native plants you can include for the early spring and, and late fall, like this dead nettle, number three, or this aster, number four. And then um, you can also use the National Wildlife Federation guide to get the, the host plants of the different kinds of caterpillars. Like that second picture is a black swallowtail caterpillar and it's on a squash, but their host plants are actually um, plants in the carrot family. So um, that includes like carrots, dill.
um, Queen Anne's lace, that kind of plant. You can also learn about insects and parts of insects. So all insects have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and six legs. And most of them have uh, four wings. And I actually learned recently that flies, diptera, which means two wings, they actually do have four wings, but two of them are not functional. And with the bees, they have four wings, but their two wings are fused. So you can learn about different life cycles, just like Maria Sibylla Marion showed her life cycles in her paintings. There's a, here's a kindergarten caterpillar. They made it by just dipping a, a, a glue cap and some green paint and making the circles. And we read the very hungry caterpillar and they drew the food that it eats. Which, of course, in, in the silly story, it's going to be cake and ice cream, but we also, uh, second graders made their own like life cycle of the monarch over here. And then go outside and see what you find. Like we found caterpillars. There's uh, my daughter holding a mantis. Getting outside will show them the different life cycles. They might find eggs. They might find cocoons. And then plant milkweed because you're going to find a lot of those life cycles. So most of these were taken in my yard around the school. So we have monarchs mating over here. We have the yellow eggs. The first instar, the caterpillar is kind of a whitish yellow and it's actually going to shave the hair off of the milkweed before it can eat it. And then as it gets older, it's going to get that pattern of black, white and yellow. And it's actually really tough for them to eat the, the common milkweed because it's so thick. So the um, Escalpia tuberosa or the more um, ornamental milkweed is actually easier for them to chew. And we raised the um, caterpillars in this giant cheese ball container where we just stuck a stick in a piece of styrofoam for, so they were able to um, make their, their pupa and then emerge and then we let it go. ties in with a lot of next generation science standards, like make observations of plants and animals to compare the diversity of life in different habitats. So we brought in plants from the outside garden and they did nature studies, like does it grow opposite or, or alternate? How are the leaves shaped? We did scientific studies of insects. I love using these uh, specimens in lucite because they can turn them all around. But we do put a piece of white paper underneath because it's hard to, to see on a dark desk. But you can talk about texture, pattern, symmetry, color, line, and shape. And just like the birds need water, so do the butterflies. Butterflies and moss taste through their feet. And uh, the males especially need minerals to, in order for them to make um, sperm. So having those rocks in there is going to give them some of those minerals. It's like having vitamin vitamin water, excuse me. And here's just a few ideas of some other host plants. So we already know monarchs like milkweed, swallowtails like dill, carrot, fennel, Queen Anne's lace, silkworm, mulberry. I've seen schools do whole units on um, silkworm and Marco Polo's um, trail. Uh, zebra swallowtail, those uh, their host plant is the pawpaw, which is grown in Rhode Island at Rocky Point Farm. But that's one of those um, little known plants that is making a comeback now. And then there's just other plants that they, they like as adults that you probably already have. These are very popular plants. Like I have lupin, you might have a willow tree or hollyhocks. So think of maybe you can add one or two more plants to help support this diversity. And here again is how seeds travel. Look how much you can get interest in the milkweed pod. It has so many different stages from the pod opening to the seeds peeking out, and then you get to blow them on the wind. And you could do a whole unit just on milkweed. There's monarchs are not the only animals that engage with the milkweed. Um, bees, especially from the Apidae family, love milkweed. There's milkweed weevils, there's milkweed aphids, there's the longhorn milkweed beetle, the swamp uh, milkweed beetle, 
and the milkweed bug. And then there's this also this milkweed tussock caterpillar. So just looking at milkweed in itself, you can make a whole unit of all these interrelated food web. There's also um, Native Americans that use the silk to weave baskets like this one on the top right that was made by a Wampanoag woman. We can teach biodiversity, food webs, culture. Here's um, an infographic I made at my Teacher Pay Teacher site. It's telling you all about the milkweed and how many different species they are. The sap actually contains latex. Now, this is what makes the monarch bot butterfly poisonous, but you can see a lot of other animals have also um, developed a resistance to it and have been able to eat it without any repercussions. And then other animals eat them. Here's um, a famous game called Deadly Lynx. It's usually done with a vole, a grasshopper, a vole, and a, and a hawk, where you take a bunch of colored sticks and you teach about a food chain. So you take the colored sticks and you throw them out in the grass and everyone, and then you divide the kids into three groups. So the first group will run out and get as many seeds as they, they can. They're a grasshopper. And then the second group, the voles, get to chase after them. Now, if they tag the grasshopper, then they get all of the sticks. So they basically have taken all the energy from the grasshopper because they ate them. And then the hawks can eat the grasshopper or the vole, so then they get to go out and tag whoever they can, and then they get all the energy. And I've also done this as mosquito, dragonfly, and frog. Now, in the case of our um, social distancing, you can't really do this. So in that case, you could get um, a plastic container full of different kinds of seeds, like peas and corn, and then throw a few red beans in there. And that, that could be the seeds. So then it becomes a game of chance. So then once everyone has gotten their seeds and come back to the group, you check how many red seeds you got. So if you have more than three red seeds, oh, well, there was pesticide on the grass and you're dead. Or sometimes I switch up the color. But if you did it with seeds or marbles or something colorful, and then if you get more than three, like if you got two red seeds, you might have a stomach ache, you get three red seeds. Oh, now you're in the hospital. And it just shows like bioaccumulation. That's what happened with, with the eagles. We would spray um, DDT on the mosquitoes, and then the fish would eat the mosquitoes, and they would bioaccumulate in them, and then the eagles would eat the fish, and then the eagles wouldn't die, but their eggs had such a thin shell that when they would sit on the eggs, they would crack. So this, this shows food web, food chain, and bioaccumulation. Here's just another example of food web that I've been working on. This shows different creek animals. And then we think about, well, how are they related? Like, what if this isopod was eaten by this bird? Or what if this raccoon ate this fish? And then think of them in the four groups. Are they a producer, like a plant? Are they a primary consumer? So that's going to be herbivores. Are they a secondary consumer? animals eating animals, or are they a decomposer or detritivore, things that break down th things that are dead, dead plants, dead, dead animals. And then you can have the what if scenarios. What if there were no more insects? What would happen to the food chain? What if there were no more birds? What would happen? We're also part of that food chain. Like what if there were no more bees? We wouldn't have food, we wouldn't last very long without insects. And this is just an example of strawberries. Strawberries are in season now. And strawberries are not just pollinated by bees, they're also pollinated by ants, by wasps, even by flies. As I said earlier, there's over 4,000 species of bees. There's about five families. Have fun with it, like figure out like how many different types of bees you can see. There's um, a couple of great citizen science projects you can do, like the greatsunflower.org. Uh, that's uh, based in California. And you can go to the website and you can actually print out these great cards. They're broken down by family, so each family is color coded. So the, um, the sweat bees are all in the green cards, Perdita are in the, the Andrina speed, uh, family are in the pink cards, the mega are in the blue cards, 
the EBITDA are in the, the hot paint cards and you can print these out. And even though they're based in California, it's a really good starter deck for identifying bees. And then in Worcester, Massachusetts, they started this project in the last year and they have a web app. They did have an Android app too, but they're no longer supporting the Android app. So if you go to beecology.wpi.edu, you can go to their web app and this one is only for bumblebees. So what you do is you take a video with your phone of the bumblebee and then there's just, um, you upload it and it's gonna let you freeze frame and they're gonna freeze frame on the head, the thorax and the abdomen. And they're gonna have you pick from different icons on the patterns on those, those three. And then it's gonna help you identify the bumblebee and it's pretty accurate. And it'll also ask you what the flower is that you found that on if you know. And they're going to start collecting data because we have very little data on native bees. Even though there's 4,000 species, mostly what we know about is our domesticated honeybee. So there are people that do do audits. So one thing that I, I've been involved with for a few years is called BioBlitz. And this year, because of social distancing, we're actually doing BioBlitz at home and we're using iNatural and checking in on different websites. But if you go to Rhode Island Natural History Survey.org or RINHS.org, you can sign up. It is free and you can learn more about your own backyard and pick different categories you want to work on. Like if you want to just focus on the plants in your yard, you can do that. Or if you want to like say, okay, this is the year I'm really going to learn about the birds that live in here. And there's all different types of apps you can use to help, like all about birds. Will help you but because you can look at pictures of the birds you can hear their call and why do they do these surveys well in rhode island we have 18,000 species of animals and plants well, how can we tell which ones are really here and if we don't know about them how can we protect them it also helps young people develop an interest in wild animals and plants because it's exciting to be outside and to find things So with birds, you could do winter birds like uh, Cornell does um, project feeder watch. You could do bird beak adaptation, like birds have different shaped beaks. Some are seed eaters, some are fish eaters, some are carrion eaters. Birds migrate, that's something you can do with graphs. You can have a bird behavior scavenger list, like is the bird eating, flying, grooming, preening, hunting. And there's, we have so many great raptor sites too. Like there's an Audubon raptor webcam. Like we watch the peregrine falcon. They just, um, they just fledged. So they're no, they've, they've left the, their spot on top of the Superman building. But Audubon uh, has a owl and raptor weekend. You could do owl detectives. You can order owl pellets and dissect them and be your own detective. Uh, pellet.com has um, owl pellets for about three or four dollars a piece. Here's just an example of the bird beak adaptation. You could break it down into four tools and all of these tools I got at the dollar store. But I got salad tongs. So the blue jay is the pliers because blue jays have to um, crack up the nuts. The mallard or, or ducks are like um, using chopsticks the pelican is like the salad tongs is going to sieve out the water and the woodpeckers like tweezers and you can create different scenarios like I had a log with holes in it and I stuffed little bits of styrofoam to pick out like pretend bugs. I use a big bucket to grab some um, clay fish in the bottom for the pelican. We got a bucket of sunflower seeds for the, um, the blue jay and then for the mallard. I just had a bucket of floating straws, chopped up straws, and that was their little bits of algae they would scoop up. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to teach all this biodiversity. Uh, this is my old school arrangement. Now I have a big plastic bin, but when you're going outside, like if you're using lenses like this, have something bright colored so you can find it because if a kid drops one of these in the grass, you will never see it again. Use lots of bright colors. Use clipboards. I like this clipboard because it's nice and thin and you can have like a whole box of them without taking up much space. Laminate everything. So this is my um, animal detective. 
field guide when we look at ways we can find animals because usually when you have a big group of kids you don't see as many animals because kids are noisy to learn about dirt what is compost identify different kinds of decomposers on my website you'll find a bunch of links where you can get scavenger hunts on this you could try keeping a worm bin in the classroom or outside you can make a pill bug habitat you just need like a big fish tank for that try drawing underground mazes and here's uh, the different evidence we look for when we do on uh, animal detectives. We look for habitats. So we look for holes in the ground, leaf litter, nest. Nest could be paper wasp nest, a bird nest, different kinds of eggs. It could be praying mantis eggs, insect eggs, bird eggs, turtle eggs. And sometimes we, we find them and we save them. Like I've saved, like we found this blue um, robin egg, found a turtle egg, and I put these in little containers so kids can handle them without crushing them, and then I can sanitize them right after. I tell them never take at home anything alive, but we found cicada skeleton, exoskeleton. This was a bumblebee that we found dead, but the kids can examine it. And in one of those owl pellets, we found a squirrel skull. And just a couple weeks ago, I found an absolutely perfect dragonfly exuvia. So the dragonfly lives underwater for up to two years, and then it comes out of its exoskeleton. Again, little containers at the Dollar Tree. I think there, this comes with like nine containers in that. Food remains. You can find chewed up leaves, chewed up acorns, animal carcasses. This is a good place to use your camera. Uh, scat and frass. There's tons of guides out there you can print out on identifying different um, animal scat. Frass is by insects. So um, beetle frass usually looks like um, sawdust. Animal tracks at this time of year, you'd be looking at mud and wet areas. And if you have the will, become an actual certified wildlife habitat where they're just going to ask you questions like, What is this habitat for? Is it for insects? Is it for birds? Are you providing food, shelter, water, and place for breeding? Get those four things, you got a wildlife habitat. And then you can put up this cool sign and everyone can celebrate. And art can be used to advocate for the environment. We've made a lot of art about creek animals and we made these art into permanent signs, which we put along the Anawasa Creek and we organized some cleanups around the, the creek. Kids put them on reusable bags. We made pins. So we're doing a lot of problem solving, but they're also becoming part of the community. They're very proud of these signs. There were 11 put up in three different towns and it's helping keep the area clean. The power of nature education. You're developing understanding, but you're also developing empathy. It's something hard to measure, but it's so important. If people don't care about the environment, they're not gonna do anything about it. You're creating conversations when Kids get outside, they want to talk about what they discovered. When they make art, they want to share it. They're learning how to problem solve. How did, why do birds have all these different beaks? What problem does that solve? They feel empowered, like, look what I did. I actually helped something today, or I helped an animal. And allow time for wonder. It's not all like getting all the standards in all the time, like play out there, have fun, enjoy being outside. Being in nature is such, a good way to reduce stress. And I went over some of these tips already, but laminate everything, have multiples, label your kits. Everything I have now is now in a clear bin so I can clearly see what's in there. Bright colors will help you find things like this leaf guide is a nice bright orange color. I usually have um, this in groups of six to 12 and I'll, I'll rotate them. Like I may have four different stations at once. So I'll have, okay, group group of six here and group of six there. And so I have 24 kids and they'll spend 50 minutes on an activity and then they'll rotate and the next group does 50 minutes on the activity. So then I get four activities in an hour. 
And those clipboards are so important, especially when it's windy, they got a writing surface. They feel important with their clipboard. It's like, I feel like such an adult or I feel like a scientist is what I've heard from kids just because they have a clipboard. Uh, and here's um, a bunch of resources. So these resources are all um, what I went over earlier, the great sunflower.org, different ways you can find um, host plants like butterflies and moths.org. And if you need to prove to the administration that this is important, this bibliography is a whole bunch of great articles that will show why teaching about kit teaching with kids outdoors is important. And I think that was my last slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to our host. That was really great, Melissa. Thank you. I could listen to that all day. If you could just go back two slides, we'll do, um, we have a couple questions, but I just um, wanted to share with you that um, I think Melissa is, is our supreme example of um, a URI Master Gardener because she is a teacher professionally, but she also really knows how to communicate science. And that is really what the URI Master Gardener program seeks to do. Um, we take in folks who have an interest in gardening or a passion for gardening um, and give a lot of information, scientific information about horticulture, and then ask them to turn around and, and share that knowledge with the community. That is what um, Melissa is doing for us tonight. Other folks work on our hotline or um, we have kiosks that go out in normal times, um, soil testing, demonstration gardens, all kinds of amazing stuff. And really we're we're really working to increase literacy of folks around horticulture to protect the environment. So if you're interested in learning more about becoming a master gardener or more about what Extension does, um, check out our website, uri.edu forward slash master gardener. Um, there is a class that starts in January and ends in April, and that's the first step in the process. So we'd encourage folks to look at that. Next slide. And then um, before we get to questions, we'll leave this slide up while we're chatting um, because there are a lot of resources online that are free for all of you. They're Rhode Island specific, but those of you in um, you know New England states, if you're in zone six or seven, even parts of eight and five, the stuff is still relevant. We have an online gardening resource page we have a gardening and environmental hotline where um, folks are answering emails every day that are sent in with photographs of plant or pest and disease issues. Um, we're very proud of that service. We also have these webinars every Tuesday at seven and Friday at noon, and you can always call us um, and ask us questions on the phone or write to us via our general email. So um, I'll leave, have Melissa leave that stuff up while we chat. We have um, two great questions, Melissa. One is from Alan. Um, he's asking, what kind of budget did you have to gather and develop all of these resources? I'm sure that's a loaded question, but um, huh. <laughs> speak by activity and then maybe how the, the body of work was put together. Um, well, when I was teaching full time, it was mostly um, through just I mean, teachers dig into their own pockets a lot. I did get, um, you should check out the, um, oh, what is the name of the grant? It's it's um, a Rhode Island Foundation grant, the Carter Spark grant. Carter Spark grant is for third and fourth grade classrooms, um, developing art and science together. So check that out. Um, we also got the, um, the U.S. Wild, Fish and Wildlife Grant for Outdoor Classrooms Grant. Um, you can check Lowe's and Home Depot have garden grants. So um, in the, the last year I did this program, we had about $5,000 in grants, but it takes time to get those. And now I'm nonprofit, so it's like starting all over. I gotta prove myself again, <laughs> like, but I'm, I'm mostly doing programs at parks and virtually right now. And I'll do like after school, before school programs. But again, like with with COVID nineteen, we had to cancel everything for the spring. So, 
but yeah, definitely check out the Carter Spark grant. It's great for that. And but you can do a lot of these at very low budget. Like I, I wanted to show you this. This is just a deli container. So if you're getting takeout, like this could have been from my Indian food. But just about an hour before this whole thing started, I found this little guy. And this is usually a hot uh, this is usually a hotline question, like, oh my God, what is this? And people think <laughs> it's the Asian longhorn beetle, which is devastating to plants, but this is actually the pine sawyer be beetle, which looks very similar, but it's just gonna eat dead and dying pine trees, not gonna hurt you. And he's been pretty tame. I've been trying to actually get him to leave this container. <laughs> Whoop, and he's on my computer now. <laughs> uh, I can get him on this pencil. <laughs> As I, I have a hummingbird flying about one foot from my head right now, so we'll see how this goes. Um, we have another question from Christine. Have you found or made any virtual field trips that we could access? I have five and they are on my website, 15minutefieldtrips.blogspot.com. 15 minute field trips. There he is. Oh, there he is. So this is not the harmful Asian longhorn beetle. This is a very harmless pine sawyer beetle. But looks very similar in many ways to the Asian longhorn beetle. Melissa and I were talking about, I found one outside here and- Very clumsy. Had a similar reaction, freaked out, and then looked on my ID book and realized that's not the really bad one. So the first time I saw one, I actually called DM, DM like freaking out, but like, no, no. <laughs> But I think there's teachable moments in all of this. A lot of the things we observe throughout the day outside are things we might take for granted, but I think they can, you know, they can spark inquiry in kids and slow kids down and um, break down some barriers. Maybe, maybe kids are afraid to touch certain things. And as you can see, Melissa is not. <laughs> you get used to it. There's some things yeah. that even like, before I wouldn't even like there's certain things that even I wouldn't touch and I'm getting better at that too. And I have a, a little autistic boy who will freak out when he has to touch glue, but he got to touch a, a three legged baby turtle last year and that was like the best day of his life. Who would have thunk it? Well, we are very appreciative. If anyone has any um, other questions, type them in. Speak now or forever hold your peace. But um, this webinar will be up online uh, by the end of June. And um, I'd encourage all of you to check out Melissa's webpage, which again is 15 minute field trips.blogspot.com. You can hear and see her enthusiasm for this. And um, I think I've always admired how you, Melissa, are able to make a very clear link between two things that aren't as clear to most people, which is left and right brain stuff or art and science. Um, and I think that's really important both for the arts and also for the sciences for us to see those things as um, companions and, and companion ways to learn. So um, with that, we will adjourn. I would encourage all of you again to reach out and um, get in touch with us. If you have gardening questions, send them to gardener at uri.edu and you can attach photographs and someone will get back to you within, I say, three business days or so. Um, otherwise, have a great summer, everyone, when it comes. Happy solstice and thanks for joining us. And Melissa, thanks so much for taking the time out to do this. All right, thanks everyone, be safe. Good night all. <laughs>